All right, so the big picture question that we're asking in uh, this section of the class is how does increasing equality of opportunity affect economic growth? So ideally, the way I would like to answer that question is to ha look at a, different, uh, a set of different societies or a set of different policies that vary equality of opportunity along the lines of what we've been talking about, giving kids access to better neighborhoods, better schools, trying to equate things more, you know, perhaps changing college admissions rules, things like that, and then basically look at the effects on economic growth directly. As you have more equality of opportunity, does it end up reducing economic growth, increasing economic growth, what happens, right? So that is a very difficult thing, as you can imagine, to try to study directly, because economic growth is such a kind of macroeconomic big picture thing. There's so many things that play into it that it's gonna be hard to look at that link directly. So instead, what we're gonna do is focus on one channel that many economists think is the key driver of growth, as I was just saying, which is innovation. Uh, and so what I'm gonna talk about here is drawn from this paper uh, with um, Alex Bell, who's a graduate student here, and other co-authors, which is who becomes an inventor in America, and that's on your syllabus if you wanna look at what I'm discussing in more detail. Okay, so what do we do in this paper? We use big data to study who becomes an inventor in America, and then get at some of these issues of how changes in equality of, uh, changes in equality of opportunity might affect innovation rates. So how do we do that? So we combine three sources of information. This illustrates, again, the types of things that you can do with new data that were not uh, possible in the past. So the first data source is patent records. So patent records in the US are publicly available information. You can just go on the web and look up all the patents that have been issued by the US government. By law, those are public record, okay? And so the, the patent records contain information on the innovation, you know, what type it was, what the details of the patent were, et cetera. Importantly, they also give you information on the inventor's name, who all was involved in creating this thing, okay? And so that allows us to identify 1.2 million people who go on to have a patent in the United States and, and who we're gonna call inventors. Now, just to be clear, patenting is one way to measure innovation. It's a very convenient way to measure innovation from our perspective. It's commonly used in economics uh, because it's easily measurable, but it's not a perfect measure of inven invention, right? So there are people who don't have a patent who invent important things, start important businesses, things like that. And then there are also people who have patents where the patents are not that important. In fact, most patents are probably not that important. They're a subset of patents that are incredibly important. Um, so it's an imperfect proxy, but certainly it's a proxy that you know, many people think is correlated at least with inventing. And it's measurable on a large scale, which is gonna be really useful for us, as you will see. Okay, the second data source we're gonna use is one we've talked about several times in this class, which is tax records. See information like information about people's parents, which college they went to, how much they're earning, things like that. Importantly, we can link the patent data to the tax data. So we're able to take the patent data, which is publicly available, into the treasury and link it internally by name and other identifying information uh, to people's tax records. So that's crucial because you can now understand the full lives of people who are inventing at a given point in time. You can see where they grew up, who their parents were, things like that. Um, and then the third piece of information that we're gonna use is information from the New York City School District on test scores of all kids who went to New York City schools between 1989 and 2009. So that's about two and a half million kids for whom we have detailed information on test scores while they were growing up, and you'll see why that also ends up being quite useful uh, for this analysis, and we're able to link that data as well to the other two data sets, okay? Okay, so I'm gonna start with this chart here using that linked data. So this chart plots your probability of having a patent by the time you're in your mid-30s uh, versus parent income, okay? And so the, the y-axis is the number of kids who are inventors out of 1,000 kids, all right? And so you can see that there's a really sharp relationship between patent rates and parent income in particular, if you happen to be born to parents in the top 1% of the income distribution, you're 10 times as likely to go on to have a patent uh, 
as if you happen to be born to parents below the median of the income distribution. So kids born to high-income families are much more likely to become inventors in the United States. So that's fact number one. All right, so why is that the case? Why do patent rates vary so much with parent income? So I think there are three potential explanations that you might think of. The first, uh, which I think is important to assess from a scientific point of view, is just this simple idea that there's genetic transmission of ability. So presumably, if your parents reach the top 1% of the income distribution, earning, say, more than half a million dollars a year, they must have been pretty talented to do whatever it took to, to get up to that level of success. Um, and we know that there's genetic transmission of ability uh, across generations. So maybe kids from higher income families just have a greater ability to innovate. And so maybe to some extent, this just reflects transmission of ability. So that's one possibility. A second possibility is that this is about preferences. So maybe low-income kids have the same abilities as kids from higher-income families, the same kind of underlying ability to become an inventor. But maybe they just choose to go into different careers. So why, you know, what's one intuitive reason that might happen? Going into innovation is a very risky, innovation is a very risky career. So there's some people, if you look at the patent data and look at people's incomes, there are a small number of people who make an enormous amount of money, people who are very successful in, their, in science or in entrepreneurial work, et cetera. And then there are lots of people who don't end up doing as well. In contrast, if you imagine pursuing an occupation like law or medicine, the risk in income might be lower than the risk in innovation. And so maybe you know, if you're a lower income kid uh, and you're doing well, you might not want to take a tremendous amount of risk given you don't have something to fall back on, you might not have wealth from your parents to fall back on, things like that. So that's another possibility. A third possibility is that it's about constraints or about environment. So maybe lower income kids have comparable talent and maybe they also have similar preferences. Maybe they do in fact want to go into innovation, just like higher income kids. But maybe they lack the resources to do so or lack exposure or you know, lack the schooling, et cetera, that higher income kids have. So we have, of course, focused a lot on the third sort of possibility in the lectures so far, the role of environment, the role of exposure. Um, but I think all of these three explanations deserve consideration. And so I'm going to start by looking at whether we think the ability explanation really holds water and see how important differences in ability seem to be. And so the way we're going to do that is this is where the test score data become useful. So we're going to go back and look at the third grade math test scores uh, of kids and look at how that relates to their probability of growing up to become an inventor in their mid-30s. Okay, so what we're doing in this chart is taking all the kids who grew up in New York City uh, and we're plotting the same uh, vertical axis, same y-axis, in mentors per 1,000 kids, but now against third grade math test scores instead of parent income. The way the chart is constructed is that we divide the distribution of third grade math test scores into 20 bins. So each dot here corresponds to 5% of the distribution, and we're plotting the average patent rate within that bin. Okay, so you can see that for the kids at the bottom of the distribution down here, um, essentially none of them go on to become inventors. And then your probability of becoming an inventor really shoots up very rapidly if you're at the top of your third grade math class. So we're using math test scores here. An interesting fact is these test scores actually are fairly diagnostic in the sense that holding fixed your math test scores, your English test scores are actually not predictive at all of your probability of becoming an inventor. Um, in contrast, if you look at other occupations or you look at, more, at earnings more generally, English test scores actually tend to be more predictive of later outcomes than math test scores. So why is that relevant here? Obviously, innovation tends to be associated with quantitative skill. And you can see that the test scores pick that up. And you know, in particular, there is actually some diagnostic value if you're at the top of your third grade math class that actually is pretty predictive of being much more likely to be an inventor than being at the middle or being at the bottom, okay? So that's a starting point, just showing you, all I'm trying to show you with this chart is 
you can use these third grade math test scores as kind of a rough proxy of ability, by no means a perfect proxy of ability, and I'm gonna come back to that in a second. But, you know, as a starting point, it gives you some sense that maybe we can use these data to gauge the importance of ability differences. And the way we can do that then, I think the more interesting analysis here, is to split the chart that I just showed you a second ago out separately by parent income. So what we're doing here now, same plot as before, but the blue series is for kids growing up in low and middle income families, families below the 80th percentile of the income distribution, and the orange is for kids growing up in high income families, families in the top fifth of the income distribution. And what you see, I think, is a very striking pattern, which is that kids, high scoring kids, are much more likely to become inventors if they're from high income families. If you're from a low income family or a middle income family, if you're in the blue and you're at the top of your third grade math class, it doesn't seem to do a whole lot for you in terms of your probability of becoming an inventor. But if you're from a high income family, there's a huge increase in the probability you become an inventor if you're at the top of your third grade math class, right? So to put it differently, you know, maybe more starkly, this seems to suggest that in America, in order to become an inventor, you need two things. You need to have a high level of quantitative skills, as proxied for by your third grade math scores here, and you need to be from a rich family. And so if you think about it from that perspective, now you think about, you know, increasing equality of opportunity, um, you know, effectively as trying to bring more of the kids who are at the top of the third grade math class in the blue line through the innovation pipeline, trying to help them sort of come up, you know, that could not only be beneficial from their own point of view to help them rise up, as we've been talking about in the previous lectures, increase their incomes and so on, but it could also potentially be beneficial from the perspective of broader society, from the perspective of economic growth, because there could be a lot of innovation that we're basically missing out on, because there are a bunch of smart kids who end up not, you know, going into these fields, maybe because of environmental differences or other factors. You know, this seems to suggest that it's not just about entirely about differences in ability, okay? So that being said, you know, I think what this analysis shows you is that the differences in innovation rates we, we started out with by parent income, they're not entirely due to differences in ability um, or differences in test scores in, in third grade. However, I don't want to overstate the case. If you look at the distribution of third grade math test scores for lower and middle income kids in the blue and high income kids in the red, it is in fact the case that there are differences, there are significant differences in the test scores of kids who come from high income families and low and middle income families by third grade. Okay, and so this is just showing you a distribution plot similar to what I showed you in the previous lecture. Think of this as just kind of the count in some sense of the number of kids who have high versus low test scores and this is normalized relative to the mean. So for those who are now, totally following the details of how this is constructed, we'll go through this in more detail in the section, but basically what this is showing you is that kids um, from higher income families tend to have higher test scores on average than kids from lower income families, okay? So there is actually some significant difference in test scores in third grade across these two groups. And so, you know, the question I think that is you wanna answer is a quantitative one. So it's clear that not everything is explained by differences in ability. That's what I showed you in the previous chart. But there are some ability differences. Uh, may maybe ability differences is not the right way to say it. There are some differences in third grade test scores, which, as I'll talk about in a second, could reflect a combination of ability and could also be due to environmental differences up to third grade. Um, and so the question really is how much of the gap in innovation is explained by third grade test scores? Like, you wanna know the quantitative answer to that question. And so we are gonna estimate how much of the gap in innovation by parent income can be explained by test scores using a technique called propensity score reweighting, which is useful in this context and is useful for many other applications. And so I'm gonna describe that uh, in a little bit of detail in, in the next two slides. Okay, so to understand the idea of propensity score reweighting, it's 
I think, easiest to think about a case where you only have two levels of test scores. So to make this really simple, suppose there are only two grades that you can get. You can get either an A or you can get a B, okay? Now, suppose that you've got 300 low-income kids, um, and let's say uh, that half of them, 150 of them, get an A, and half of them get a B. Now, high-income kids, they have higher grades on average. For high-income kids, let's assume that 200 of them get an A, and 100 of them get a B. Okay, so there are differences. This is basically like a simple example version of what I was showing you before in the actual data, right? Okay, so what we wanna do is to figure out what the patent rates for low-income kids would be if they had the same distribution of grades as high-income kids. And that's exactly the idea of propensity score reweighting. okay? So in particular, in order to adjust for these test score differences, what we're gonna do is count the students who got an A twice as much as the students who got a B when calculating the average patent rate for low-income kids. So let me just walk you through the logic of that. So among high-income kids, there are two times as many kids in this example who get an A as who get a B, right? Whereas with the low-income kids, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. So in order to make the low-income kids sort of look like the high-income kids in terms of their distribution of grades, we're basically gonna count the kids who got an A in the low-income group twice as much as the kids who got, got a B. So to think about this very mechanically, imagine that you had a spreadsheet of your data or you open the data in Stata and you've got grades and you've got people's incomes. Essentially, you can think about what we're doing here is think of cutting and pasting the data for kids who got an A from uh, low-income families and just creating a copy of that, duplicating that data, and then taking the average for low-income children. So that's a mechanical way to think about it. You can do that with the software by basically weighting low-income children who got an A twice as much as low-income children who got a B. So you can you know, do it in different ways in terms of the arithmetic calculation. The point is, is that by putting more weight on the children who got an A in the low-income group, you make them look, in terms of their distribution of grades, similar to what the high-income kids' distribution of grades look like looks like, right? And so what that does then is it tells us what the patent rate for low-income kids would look like if they had the same grades as high-income kids. So that technique is useful not just here in what I'm gonna show you, but as you can imagine, in lots of circumstances where you've got differences across groups and you wanna account for those differences, you know, it could be differences in their family backgrounds or their race or their, you know, education, uh, educational outcomes, as in this case, et cetera, this technique is gonna be pretty useful. Um, and so we'll go through that in more, in more detail in section as well. Uh, but jumping now to the result of what you get from this in this context, so what you find here is if you do this propensity score reweighting, you find that if low-income kids had the same test score distribution as high-income kids, the gap in innovation rates by parental income would fall by 31%, okay? So 70% of it would remain, and about 30% of it would be closed. That is, 30% can be accounted for by the differences in third-grade test scores across low versus high-income kids. Now, the way I look at that is coming down here to this middle bullet, um, you know, there are of course substantial differences in environment for low versus high income kids, even by the time they get to third grade, right? By the time you're eight years old, you've experienced different neighborhoods, different schools, different preschools, lots of different things. So I don't think anybody would think of test scores as th at third grade as a pure measure of ability. It's probably ability plus environment to, to a significant extent. But even despite that, the 31% number is not all that large. And so, you know, the, the, I think what this suggests is that relatively little of the gap in innovation is explained by differences in ability insofar as ability is captured by these early test score data, okay? So that 31% number was using the data just for third grade test scores, which is the earliest point at which we have standardized tests in the US typically. So you might then ask, okay, how does this change 
if we use data on test scores in later grades, not just third grade, but also fourth grade, fifth grade, et cetera, do we explain different amounts of the gap in innovation? And this chart answers that question. So the first dot here is the 31% number that I was just talking about. How much of the gap in innovation is explained by test scores in third grade? Then we repeat that analysis for fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, and so on. And you see a very clear upward sloping pattern. The later you measure test scores, the more of the gap in innovation in adulthood that you explain. And so what is this chart showing you? It's basically saying that as kids get older, low income kids are kind of falling behind higher income kids, right? And so by the time, if you were to extrapolate this out to the end of high school, we don't have the test score data here past eighth grade, but if you were to extrapolate out to like 12th grade, you know, by that point, if you were to look at kids, say SAT scores, you wouldn't be surprised to see that higher income kids are much more likely to go into innovation than lower income kids because there are big gaps in achievement by the time you get to high school. But those are steadily growing over time. If you look early on and you look at differences in test scores, they don't look all that large between kids from different socioeconomic statuses. And so that, I think, is very consistent with the view that a big part of the picture here might be about differences in environment uh, and differences in resources, all the things that we've been talking about, rather than just differences in ability or differences in preferences, okay? So it's a, it's a data point that, that points in that direction. Okay, questions on this? Yeah. 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 I mean, so some of this, you know, when you're chopping the data this fine, there's going to be some noise in these estimates. You, you know, some kids in that group happen to go on to become inventors. So we'd expect to see some bouncing around. Um, you're right, like there is a spike there. I, you know, my sense is if you had a very large sample or if you were to repeat this in other data sets, I'd be surprised if that survived, whereas I think the thing at the top is a more significant substantial spike. So you're gonna see some bouncing around, but that's a good observation, yep. Okay, so, like, when you, could you use the word to represent the gap in innovation by math scores? Yeah. yeah. Yes, good, good question, good question. So here, um, all you can learn, it's, it's like an account, I think of it as like an accounting exercise. If you had kids with comparable test scores, um, if, if you were to try to equate the distributions, how much would the gap change? You're right that we don't know from a causal standpoint that actually doing something to increase the scores of low income kids would change their patent rates by 31% relative to high income kids. There's nothing we've done that shows direct causation there. But what this tells you is from sort of an accounting perspective, so you know, why is this useful? Nevertheless, even though you don't know cause and effect, I think you're absolutely right. Um, suppose you were to find with this exercise that you accounted for 100% of the gap by adjusting for test scores. You might then be much more interested in understanding how you change the test scores of kids at early ages is, you know, the, basically the hypothesis that it's about ability, while you wouldn't have proven that that's the case, you start to become more interested in that hypothesis as a real possibility. If I think, if you get a very low number here, as you actually do in practice, I think it potentially points in different directions. But your questions, it's, it's uh, actually, you know, sets up well what we're gonna talk about in a few minutes, which is to go beyond, this is essentially like a correlational analysis or an accounting analysis, to try to show directly some evidence that there's a causal effect of environment. And the reason we go down that path is this seems to suggest that it's not all about ability, but that's absolutely right. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. From both groups. That would achieve exactly the same thing. 
that would, that would achieve exactly the same thing. In practice, we're not sampling, right? We have all the data for kids who went to New York City public schools. So a different way to implement the propensity score reweighting would be to take that data and sample kids at the same rate from all the different levels of grades. If you do it that way, you're effectively gonna throw out some data because you're doing random sampling, so it's inefficient. It's gonna give you less precise estimates, but it achieves exact, your, your, your intuition is exactly right. You're gonna get to exactly the same place. Yeah. 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 It do, it's, you know, you're crossing a lot of things, right? So you're talking about, and that's why you see some of the bouncing in those graphs. You're talking about a few hundred kids who go on to become inventors. I think it's something on the order of 500 to 1,000 in some of those graphs. When you're taking New York City kids, low income, go on to become inventors. That's the power, though, of having starting from such a massive sample. Even if you get down to that small group, you still have enough data to say something. But it's not, it's not like having the full population data. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay, so up to this point, um, we've been talking about gaps in innovation by parental income. What I wanna to turn to next is that it's not just about parental income. You actually see a very similar phenomenon in other dimensions as well. So in particular by race and ethnicity and also by gender. So just to show you that with some similar graphs. So this is showing you patent rates versus third grade test scores now cut cutting the data by race and ethnicity rather than by parental income. And what you see here is a similar pattern for white kids and Asian kids scoring at the top of their third grade math class. They're much more likely to become inventors. But for black and Hispanic kids, the relationship is unbelievably flat. Even if you're a black kid, you know, at the top of your third grade math class, just like Hispanic and white kids, your probability of becoming an inventor is you know, literally not higher. It's, it's very close to zero, um, even at that level, right? And that, you, know, you can see that from casual observation. If you look at the number of scientists or entrepreneurs who are from a minority background, um, it, it, there's just a tremendous underrepresentation in the US of uh, kids from, uh, of non-white, non-Asian kids in, in a number of fields, and this is, this is consistent with that. Uh, you see a similar thing if you cut the data by gender. So if you look at uh, boys versus girls scoring at the top of their third grade math class, boys at the top of third grade math class are much more likely to become inventors than girls. Now on the gender dimension, turns out that we have data to look at this not just at present, which is basically everything that I've been showing you. Kids, you know, think of it as like growing up in the 1980s, but we can look at the data historically as well uh, by gender. And so you can ask what fraction of inventors are women by the year in which they are born, okay, to get a sense of how this is changing over time. And so you can see that back in 1940, something like 8% of patents, sorry, for people born in 1940, uh, among people born in 1940, 8% of people who had patents were women, okay? So 8% of inventors were women. You can see that this is clearly going up steadily over time. It's like almost perfectly linear. But if you look at the rate of growth, the average change in each year is 0.27 percentage points. So it's gonna take another 118 years to reach gender parity in innovation in the US, okay? So uh, to, to get to a 50-50 share, right? So it's incredibly slow progress in terms of uh, closing the gap uh, in, in terms of innovation by gender. And we don't have this data by race and ethnicity or by parental income, but my guess is you, know, you see essentially no change on, on those dimensions uh, as well. And so you know, concluding this segment on looking at test scores and thinking about ability differences, my take on this is that suggests that most of the innovation gap across income, race, and gender is not due to ability uh, differences. However, I wanna be clear, and some of the questions get at this, I think this evidence is not by itself conclusive because tests are, of course, an imperfect measure of ability, and we have no causal evidence of changing anything, having a causal effect in, in what we've seen so far. And so, you know, wh what do I mean by tests are an imperfect measure of ability? Your third grade math test score might be one of many different things that matters for your likelihood of becoming an inventor. And maybe it's the case that kids from higher income families, while they don't have, uh, it's not because they have higher third grade math test scores, 
it's because they have other skills that end up paying off, you know, in the labor market and innovation or something like that. We can't rule out that hypothesis based on the evidence that I've shown you. Moreover, genetic ability, maybe it's not manifested in early test scores. Maybe it only shows up in the labor market. That's another hypothesis that you might at least worry about. So given that, I think this evidence is suggestive but not conclusive, we're now going to take a different approach. We're going to directly study the effects of environment by focusing on the effect of exposure to innovation in particular during childhood through your family and through your neighbors. Uh, and we're going to show, uh, as I'll convince you hopefully in a, in a second, that there is actually a pretty significant causal effect of childhood environment in dri driving these patterns. So let's start by analyzing the relationship between kids' patent rates and their own parents' patent rates. So we're going to start with a very simple tabulation. I'm going to say, suppose your own parents had a patent versus your own parents didn't have a patent. What's the probability you yourself go on to become an inventor? So this is enormously different. You're about 10 times as likely to go on to have a patent yourself if your parents had a patent. Kids of inventors are more likely to be inventors themselves, OK? Um, so that is consistent. That fact is consistent with two different possibilities. It could, again, be a reflection of genetics. Maybe some people are just skilled at innovation. Uh, they transmit that to their kids, and their kids are also more skilled at innovation. It could also be about exposure. So maybe I hear a lot about innovation in a particular field. I learn more about the career. I do more science, whatever, as I'm, I'm growing up, if I grow up in that sort of family. And that's why, because of that environmental difference, I'm more likely to become an inventor. So from the data I've shown you so far, you can't tell which of those two things is going on, right? However, turns out there's a nice feature of these data, which is why we actually ended up focusing on patent rates for this paper. Um, there's a nice feature that I think allows you to isolate the causal effect of exposure in a pretty compelling way. So the way we do that and illustrates more broadly how you can learn from these large data sets, even if you can't run experiments. Um, the way we do that is by analyzing the propensity to patent by specific technology class. So it turns out, as I'll show you in a second, patents are classified into very narrow technology classes. So there are, uh, you can get a patent in computers or in, uh, you know, in pharmaceuticals, but then they're further classified into exactly what type of uh, computer patent did you have? Was it semiconductors? What type of semiconductor? Things like that. And the basic kind of assumption we're going to make or the intuition underlying our approach to isolate causal effects of environment is the idea that genetic ability to innovate is very unlikely to vary across very similar technology classes. So I'll make this more concrete in a second. But in order to show you that, the first thing we need to do is to identify technology types that are very similar to each other. We need a way to kind of quantify the distance between two different technology classes of patents. And so the way we're going to do that is, I think, one intuitive approach. It's to ask how many people are there who have patents in two given classes. So suppose I have patent type A and patent type B. How many people are there in America who have patents in both of those fields? So just think about how that's going to work intuitively. There are going to be very few people who have patents in both computers and biology. There are going to be lots of people who have patents in two different types of computer innovation. And so we're going to naturally classify two different, you know, very similar kind of computer innovations as being close to each other. And then computers versus biology versus chemistry as things that are far apart. So to make that concrete, show you how this works, let's take one example. So Let's take the category of computers and communications. Within that, there's a subcategory of communications. And then that's further classified into various technology classes. Uh, and so you know, these are things like pulse or digital communications. That's one technology class. The next closest class to that by our method is a patent in what's called a demodulator. Then there's patenting in a modulator, um, oscillators, things like that. Okay, so these are all like communications technology, basically, that are very similar to each other. So what's our approach? 
at some level, basically, we're assuming that you can't have a gene to specifically, you know, be good at making an oscillator, but not a modulator, right? We're assuming that genetics don't vary at that level of granularity. Like maybe, you know, you have genetic skill and innovation in general, or the types of things that lead to innovation in certain types of computing technology or whatever, but it would be surprising if genetic ability varies at this level of specificity. And so what we then ask is, if your parents are more likely to have a patent in one of these classes, say in demodulators, are you more likely to invent a demodulator in particular, or are you also more likely to invent an oscillator and an amplifier or you know, whatever else? And turns out, remarkably, that the answer is that you are likely to do exactly what your parents did, like literally, and not even the thing that's won over. So this is um, the distance between the field in which you patent and your father's, the, the patent, the, the technology class in which your father patented. And you can see that zero means you invent in exactly the same technology class as your parents. And you can see there's a huge spike there. And then it just, even one thing over, if your dad invented a modulator, I guess you're not that likely to invent a demodulator, which surprises me, but uh, it's actually a fact in the data. Uh, and then, you know, there's essentially very little impact away from that. So that strikes me as, you know, pretty compelling evidence that the mechanism here is not actually about genetic transmission of ability. It's about what you see as you're growing up, maybe like an internship you got in uh, while you were a kid, or what you were exposed to in various ways, and so forth, okay? Questions on this? Okay. All right, so now, I think that's a useful result for understanding what might be going on, but from a policy point of view, it's not terribly useful in and of itself, because parents are obviously not a very replicable source of exposure to innovation. So it's just gonna be a fact that higher income kids, um, you know, they're gonna be more exposed to innovation through their families. You're not gonna be able to change that very easily at a family level, right? So now what we're gonna do next is analyze a broader source of influence, which is uh, your, your neighbors. Uh, and we're gonna start by examining the geographic origins of inventors uh, by looking at how patent rates vary depending upon where kids grow up. All right, and so um, this map shows you that. So it's a map similar to what we've looked at in the context of upward mobility, but now we're looking at the innovation outcome. Dark blue colors represent areas where more kids who grow up there are likely go on to become inventors, and white colors here represent areas where kids are less likely to grow up to become inventors, okay? so. Broadly, first of all, you know, you might be thinking to yourself, how does this compare to the other maps we've seen in this class? You know, the Northeast, the West Coast generally have higher rates of innovation, kids who grow up to become inventors, the Southeast has lower rates of kids who grow up to become inventors. So there's some correlation with that, with the upward mobility outcomes in general. But there's some pretty stark differences too. So let me give you a couple examples. So Silicon Valley, lots of kids who grow up there go up go on to become inventors. That's consistent with the idea that exposure matters. If you're growing up around a lot of inventors, you yourself are more likely to become an inventor. If you look at Detroit, Detroit's kind of interesting because Detroit, if you looked at our earlier maps, it typically ranks lowest in most of the measures of upward mobility. But there are actually lots of kids who grew up in Detroit who go on to become inventors. Our sense is that's because you're growing up around lots of engineers and people working at um, auto uh, companies, and we think that kind of thing might have an influence. Another example of that is, what is this blip in Texas where in general you see white colors, but one patch of blue? People know what that is? That's Austin, Texas. Um, you know, again, has that feel of place where a lot of innovation is going on. The kids who grow up in Austin are more likely to become inventors, okay? And so that actually turns out to be a pretty robust pattern in the data, kids who grow up in areas, commuting zones, where a lot of the adults living there are in the innovation field, themselves 
are more likely to become inventors in adulthood. So it's very consistent with the idea that same kind of mechanism that I was describing to you with the parents. If you're around lots of adults who are in this career path, you yourself are more likely to pursue that career path. That's what this chart shows, right? And so what I want to now come to again uh, is what does this teach us about the mechanism? How do we know that these geographic differences that I've been showing you are driven by the causal effects of place rather than just sorting? So maybe the kids in Silicon Valley have higher patent rates because they're just different types of families out there relative to the families living elsewhere in America. And so again, we can use this technology class approach to, to get at that. And so in the paper, we estimate what's called a fixed effects regression model to, to show the result that I'm going to describe to you. But I'm just going to describe it with an example, which basically captures the, the central idea. So uh, suppose you have two people who are currently living in Boston. Okay? And let's say one of them grew up in Silicon Valley, and one of them grew up in Minneapolis, which you may not know is a medical device hub. There are a lot of firms that manufacture medical devices in Minneapolis. Right? It so turns out, if you look at the data, effectively what you see is this. The kid who's currently living in Boston, they grew up in Silicon Valley, they're much more likely to patent in computers. And if they grew up in Minneapolis, they're much more likely to patent in medical devices. And that turns out to be true not just at the level of computers versus medical devices, but at that very fine level that I was showing you before, like oscillators, modulators, et cetera. Like whatever was going on in the area around you, is exactly the type of career you're likely to pursue in adulthood, again, suggesting that exposure and environment really seems central here, has an important causal effect. Question? Couldn't this just be totally due to the fact that it's still aligned with what your parent does? Your parents usually have to work for companies that have other people who do what they do, and so it doesn't really have anything to do with people who live, you know, two blocks away, but it's just still aligned. We saw there was like a 10 to 1 ratio or something of people who have their parents who are inventors and their inventors. And so you're saying, could this result be driven by your parents? Yeah, so actually what we're doing here, which I didn't mention, it's a good point, is we're throwing out all kids whose own parents are inventors, exactly to deal with that concern. And so among kids whose parents are not inventors, their neighbors or whoever else is around really seems to matter. That, that's what you're learning here. OK, so bottom line from this, I'm going to stop here. Basically, you know, environment seems to play a role in driving these differences. Next lecture, we'll wrap up on this and move on to education. Today, we're going to wrap up on innovation and equality of opportunity for the first few minutes. So we're going to wrap up on the first section of the class, and then we're going to transition to the next topic, which is going to be education. So to remind you where we left off, at the end of the last lecture, we talked about this chart here, which shows you the chances that kids go on to become inventors, as measured by having a patent on the vertical axis versus the average patent rate among adults in the commuting zone in the metro area where they grew up. And we saw there was a tight relationship between those two things. Kids who grow up, for instance, in San Jose in the Silicon Valley area are much more likely to become inventors than kids who grew up, say, in Brownsville, uh, Texas. Um, and more broadly, we discussed evidence that it's not just whether you become an inventor or not, but the type of innovation, the field you go into, that's greatly influenced by what's going on around you, uh, where you are growing up. Okay, so um, that evidence on who becomes an inventor that we talked about at the end of the last lecture, you'll note is consistent with the broader evidence that we've talked about over several lectures that neighborhood environments in childhood really seem to matter for kids' long-term success, not just in terms of whether you become an inventor, but in terms of earnings, in terms of college attendance rates, teenage birth rates, you know, various outcomes that we've talked about. Now, one thing, though, that I think you learned from this paper on inventors in particular that shaped my own thinking about these issues is that these differences across areas in the production of inventors are unlikely to be due to the types of broad factors we often think about, like differences in the quality of schools, across places or differences in the resources that you have in some areas of the country or some neighborhoods versus other neighborhoods. And why do I say that? You know, we saw, as I talked about in the last lecture, that certain places tend to produce kids who go into, say, uh, patenting and medical devices, 
or you know, a particular type of semiconductors, et cetera. And it's very hard to imagine that those differences are driven by something very broad, like differences in the quality of schools, right? It's hard to imagine that the schools in Minneapolis, for instance, are particularly good in training you to make medical devices versus you know, in some other place, the schools are particularly good at oscillators or modulators or the various things that we were talking about. And so what is, I think, a much more plausible explanation of these very technology class specific impacts that we're seeing is that these exposure effects are kind of direct exposure effects driven by things like mentoring or role models, right? So you see somebody pursuing a particular career or you get connected to an internship at a particular company in a particular field and you kind of go down that path. It's less likely to be broad brush stuff um, that is the type of thing that government policy typically focuses on, right? Like let's spend more dollars on schools in this area. These sorts of mechanisms, you know, maybe they'd be affected by that type of thing, but they point to very direct channels. And so motivated by that evidence, in our group we're increasingly focusing on things like mentoring or specific programs that will change the pathways that kids choose to pursue, okay? And so I think that's a useful lesson in understanding mechanisms, not just in the context of innovation, but I sus suspect more broadly in understanding the determinants of upward mobility, uh, the channels we should be thinking about are very specific rather than quite broad. Now, further evidence supporting this view comes from the fact that the impacts of exposure are not just technology class specific, but are also gender specific. So I'm gonna spend most of the beginning of this lecture focused on gender disparities because you'll see very similar and I think quite interesting patterns on that dimension. So let me show that evidence by turning to this chart here. So what we're doing here is looking at the effects of again growing up in different neighborhoods, um, going back to the evidence that I just showed you in the initial slide, right? That kids are more likely to become inventors if they grow up in an area with more inventors but now we're gonna break that data down by the gender of the child and the gender of the inventors, the adults in the area where they're growing up, okay? So this first bar here says, what is the impact of moving from a below average metro area in terms of rates of innovation to an above average metro area in terms of rates of innovation on the probability that a child becomes an inventor, where in the first bar we're looking at the effect of male adult inventors on the chance that boys go on to become inventors. Okay, so as a boy, if you grow up in an area where there are relatively few men who are inventing versus many men who are inventing, what impact does that have on the probability you become an inventor? And you can see that the odds that you become an inventor go up by about one in a thousand. So that may not seem like a huge number, but you have to remember that the base rate here is something like only eight out of a thousand people uh, have patents. And so relative to that base, this is a quite substantial increase, something like you know, 10 or 15% increase in the probability you become an inventor from this exposure channel. Now, if you look at the second bar, same kind of analysis, but now we're asking, suppose you uh, grow up in an area with relatively many female inventors versus few female inventors, what impact does that have on the chance that boys go on to become inventors? And you can see the answer there is that it's, it's essentially zero. It's a statistically insignificant slightly negative estimate, okay? So what you see from these first two bars is that boys' probabilities of becoming inventors are greatly influenced by what the men in the area are doing, but not the women. And then if you look at the data for women, you see the exact converse, right? So girls, if they grow up in an area with many male inventors as opposed to relatively few male inventors, there's no impact at all. If they grow up in an area with many female inventors, they're much more likely to become inventors uh, than if they grew up in an area with very few female inventors. So these impacts are gender specific, okay? The, the, the impacts of exposure that we were talking about, which again, you know, points to a channel that is something like mentoring or role model effects, you know, seeing someone else doing, uh, seeing yourself in someone else's shoes, someone similar to you, as opposed to something about schools that might be particularly good at educating you in one way uh, or another. Now, um, the, the magnitudes of these effects, again, are quite large. And you know, one way to think about it on the gender dimension is that if girls were as exposed to female inventors as boys currently are to male inventors, 
the gender gap in innovation would fall by half. So you remember in the last lecture I showed you that something like 15% um, of patents today go to women, so there's still an enormous gender gap in innovation uh, even today. If you, what, what this chart's showing you is if somehow, you know, magically you had the same um, fraction of female and male inventors kids were exposed to, that gap, 1585 gap, would shrink in half. You'd immediately close half of the gender gap in innovation. So these differences in terms of who kids are exposed to are quite important in driving the patterns that we're seeing in the aggregate. Okay, now to get, go a little bit further and think about you know, what might be driving that, further evidence supporting this view that it's about aspirations and what types of paths kids choose to pursue, there's a nice paper by Bion et al. in Science from a couple years ago where they conduct experiments to analyze the development of gender stereotypes about intellectual ability. And so this is like a lab experiment at a smaller scale that allows you to get at mechanisms in, in maybe a little bit more of a precise way. So what they do here is present kids with pictures of men and women and ask them to say who is really nice and who is really smart. And what they show in the paper is that if you take five-year-old kids, there's no difference in terms of you know, the patterns, in terms of who kids identify as being really nice or really smart between boys and girls. Whereas if you do the same thing with six-year-olds, girls are much more likely to choose the man as being really smart and the woman as being really nice. Okay? So you can see that over time, this is one piece of evidence along uh, that line, but there's quite a bit of evidence you know, that over time these gender stereotypes develop. Uh, and then you can see how that leads to the types of patterns we've been showing in uh, the larger data, how this plays out in terms of the careers women and men choose uh, and so forth. Okay? Um, similarly, you know, just as another piece of evidence from that study, girls are less likely to choose to play games that are for children who are really smart at age six than at age five. So it's not just about identifying different people. You know, the actual actions kids take seem to vary by age in accordance with these uh, sorts of gender stereotypes. So, you know, coming back now to uh, what this means for rates of innovation, economic growth, and opportunity, you know, the way we started talking about these topics, what I think this evidence suggests is that the gender gap in innovation is in some ways self-perpetuating due to social norms and aspirations. At some level, you know, basically what I've just shown you is that the underrepresentation of female scientists in the current generation effectively reduces the number of female scientists and inventors in the next generation, right? Because these exposure effects seem so important in practice. And so I think that could be part of the reason why the gender gap in innovation, while it's closing, it's closing, as I showed you in the previous lecture, at an incredibly slow rate of a quarter of a percentage point roughly per year. So it'll take another 120 years to, to close the gap completely. The way you can get that sort of dynamic is if you have this chicken and the egg kind of situation where you really need something to jumpstart the fraction of um, female inventors in a given generation in order to have downstream impacts on subsequent generations. But that is obviously a very challenging thing to figure out how to do. Um, but it shows you, you know, why these, these problems are, are so difficult and so, so important, I think. So what is at stake from tackling these issues? So to summarize the work that we've been talking about on innovation and growth, um, we try to quantify the impacts of the various disparities that we looked at and um, talk about a phenomenon that we label in the paper lost Einsteins, the idea that there are lots of people who could have gone on potentially to have very impactful innovations that would have had big impacts on the world and increased economic growth and kind of benefited everyone, um, except for a lack of exposure to an innovation, to innovation or you know, lack of resources during childhood. And so quantitatively, that is a, a big deal. Uh, in particular, we show the statistic in the paper where if women, minorities, and kids from low-income families were to invent at the same rate as high-income white men, the innovation rate in America, the number of inventors, just mechanically you can calculate this out, would quadruple, right? So there are lots of people who, based on all the evidence I showed you in the previous lectures, seem at some level perfectly capable of becoming inventors, and some of them might have had been very talented and have had incredibly impactful innovations, 
uh, but they are not coming through the innovation pipeline, and there's potentially a big cost to the aggregate economy if we think innovation is really the central driver of economic growth uh, as a result of these lost Einsteins. So one nice uh, impact of putting out that work um, uh, about a year and a half ago is that that has led, you know, I think, to increased attention on these issues. So one particular example of that uh, is this group called Pioneer that was founded by a group of uh, venture capitalists and others in um, Silicon Valley. Daniel Gross here, you see pictured on the right, is uh, one of the key people who started it. And basically the idea of this group is that they are trying to identify more of these lost Einsteins, try to break out of the mold of the typical people who are receiving VC funding and starting companies in Silicon Valley, uh, et cetera. Um, and so if you look at you know, what Daniel Gross says in uh, explaining why he started this group, Pioneer, um, what, uh, what he says you know, is that I've been reading research that touches on how ambitious kids fare with a lot of interest. For example, kids from high income top 1% families are 10 times more likely to become inventors than those from below median income families, the statistic we talked about in the last lecture, despite low income kids scoring just as well on early childhood tests, et cetera, right? And so he talks about lost Einsteins. He talks about other evidence that, you know, math Olympiad winners are geographically broadly distributed, but there are only certain places where they go on um, to produce significant mathematical work because they don't have the environmental support to, um, to kind of develop their talent in many parts of the world. And so um, what they're doing in this group in, in Pioneer is, uh, as they say, building a community of creative young people working on interesting projects around the globe. And so basically what they've tried to do is democratize access to Silicon Valley to, you know, to the extent they can. So apply with any project you need help with, you get $1,000 round trip ticket to Silicon Valley, and then some people you know, will receive more substantial funding, I think on the order of $100,000 to, to pursue their ideas. So this is a you know, small scale effort to try to tackle these issues. Um, but more broadly, you know, for the purposes of the lectures I've been giving on equality of opportunity, I think what this illustrates is efforts like this to increase equality of opportunity. We talked about before, you know, you might worry that that might actually adversely impact economic growth. Is there a trade-off between reducing inequality and perhaps reducing growth? And this is, I think, a good example of where it can actually go in the other direction, that you help a bunch of people uh, climb the income ladder or achieve better outcomes themselves. And in the process, you potentially help society quite a bit if you've strengthened the innovation pipeline and lead to, that leads to the discovery of new drugs or new technologies uh, that, that improve everyone's lives. Okay, so let me stop there, see if there are any questions about the innovation and growth work before uh, moving on. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. I don't remember the base rates off the top of my head in that paper. You could look it up easily. My instinct, my vague recollection is that there are not, even in the levels, there are not significant disparities at young ages, and then everyone starts to shift more over time to the typical stereotypes. But good question. I don't remember the exact numbers. Yeah. Yeah. So do you mean just like mechanically, how do we do that in the data? Yeah, yeah, okay. So let me just say a little bit more about exactly what we're doing here. So actually these estimates are coming from a regression where we're regressing the probability a kid becomes an inventor, either a boy or a girl, right? On the number of male inventors in an area and the number of female inventors in the area at the same time. So it's a regression with two variables on the right-hand side. And 
the reason that's important, and I think this is what you're getting at, is that's how you separate out the effects of the two different genders, because you hold fixed the number of male inventors, and you say, what's the impact of having more female inventors? Regression is one technique for doing that. You control for one variable while looking at the impact of another variable. But conceptually, the way I think about it basically is we have this data on the number of people who are inventors in all the different parts of the US, right? And you can break that down by gender. So you have number of female inventors in Silicon Valley, you know, number of male inventors in Silicon Valley, et cetera, et cetera, for every place, right? And so the thought experiment is, suppose I move from a place that's below average at the 25th percentile of the distribution of male inventors to the 75th percentile, but I do that in a way that holds fixed to num the number of female inventors. So I'm gonna compare places where they have the same female innovation rate, but they're different in terms of male innovation rates. And then I'm gonna look at the impacts on what happens to boys and girls' uh, patent rates, right? And then conversely for women. So in practice, the way we operationalize that is by running a regression with both male and female invention rates on the right-hand side, and we're basically plotting those coefficients here. Does that help in clarifying what we're doing? Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. So you would worry with any of these things that you know maybe this is just association in terms of the types of industries in different places or career pathways and so forth. So then we again do the technology class thing that I was talking about before. So women, when they're exposed to women in a particular field, right? So like I was saying, you know, medical devices or particular kind of amplifier, et cetera. If you have exactly that type of innovation going on by women in your area, you're more likely to pursue exactly that field but not boys. So same logic as before, to the extent you found that persuasive in dealing with the correlation versus causality issue, the same exact thing works here. Anybody else? 